Good evening. So for the last, well, for the August uh, game jam, for the epic uh, monthly game jam, I decided to make a, well, it's essentially a Metroid clone uh, with the bubble doors and everything, but I decided to build the world out of little voxel cubes of various size. Uh, and I've essentially been asked to... Uh, to do a little, well, not tutorial, but show basically the tech, how it was, uh, how it was done. So in this video, I'm gonna essentially show how this, uh, how I did my little jam, game jam entry. So as you can see, it's, uh, the world is made of cubes. Some of them are destructible, some are not. Uh, they heat up and then they, well, these are actually need the missiles. And yeah, so I'm going to show you how to voxelize the world or build levels out of little voxels. So first thing to, sh to show is how the world is actually assembled. Let's go to unlit. And you can see every section of the world. The start section, the various corridors, You've got, uh, when you go in here, this is where you get the high jump upgrade. The end boss corridor, the main, the, the big main shaft, which has a lot of little platforms going down. So this is a pretty big world. Uh, originally, I had the doors do level streaming. So these blueprints here would actually load the next sections as you... Well, as you open the door, the next section would load. But what ended up happening is because of jam the jam time constraint, I had to take that feature out and just put the entire world all at once in the, well, all at once in one level, in the persistent level. This was just easier this way. This, I mean, you don't have, it. this was built in three days. So, so how this is built right now, um, it's using a blueprint, which is just the voxel area. There's almost nothing to this. Uh, there's create grid. The grid itself, it's just a series of instant static meshes, the uh, small cubes, medium cubes, and the large cubes. They also get data from a sector data. Well, it's just a data table for each of the sectors to get the color, to just change the color of the cubes. So this is how you have uh, the main shaft is these purples, this is the green and yellow. The lava area is these yellow, oranges, and red. So this is just gotten from a data table that has the color for each sector and which the data file to load to get the cube information. So what the voxel area has is inside, it simply loops through every cube uh, see, break cube data, I just looped through everything. If I go in this macro, it's really just read from each data table, the list of cubes, output them, add them to the instances. There, there's really nothing else than that. But to actually build this, I needed to create those voxel areas. And to do that, Let's load the other level, which is the world designer. Now in here, what you have is a series of splines which are defined by these grids. So I have these tunnels, these tunnels, these spheres, and this is like the final boss arena, the entrance, is defined by this set of spheres and little and little tunnel. And what I did is I dragged the voxel area generator, which is built around. Let me just grab one here. And from here, if I well, let's grab a smaller one, so it generates a bit faster. Um, well, this one's already built, but let's build it again. So. Let's just change this voxel area to be a different one. Um, let's say red sector main shaft. So red sector main shaft showed up down here. That that's just uh, was just a display one. But the actual generator, if I click here, 
And then I tell it to generate cubes. And I just run this little build grid blue utility, run it. There's a bit of a delay. It's actually scanning the entire volume. And within the volume, every time there is a, it encounters one of these tunnels, it does not put a cube. And then I do a second pass to remove all the empty space or actually the solid space so that if I don't have, it basically does a cube adjacency test to only keep the cubes that are in the borders. So any bordering cubes are the only ones that are showing up. So that's how this is generating. So right now it's actually doing a mathematical check. So if I go into the generator itself, go into the create grid, so it clears the instant static meshes. Then it gets all actors of interface voxel carver interface. Uh, these are the tunnels and well, I call them bubbles. The tunnels and the spheres are just voxel carvers. So then when the generator goes through its loop to build the actual grid from here, generate grid, it will, every time it encounters a, well, for every cube, it tests against the other voxel uh, carvers to see if it's open or not. So that interface, actually, if we just go into it, has only one method, which is test location, and it will tell you if it's within the envelope of the carver, of the shape that is carving a hole, if it's too far, so it just skips out immediately, or if it's mandatory. This was used for the platform generation that I wanted to have cubes show up like, I absolutely needed cubes to show up, even if they're within uh, another scope of a carved interface or, well, in a tunnel. So in here, when I generate the grid, uh, you, you go in. Iterate grid is simply a macro that does the XYZ for loop for me and just gives me the next one uh, when it's done, the current location and the indices for X, Y, and Z. So this is just a fancier for loop for myself. And in here, I go and I test, I test a cube. Uh, at first, I am, the, the cubes, you notice there's three levels of cubes. There's the large, there's mediums, and the small. So I first scan at the large cube, which are 200 units wide. Uh, and then if that cube, basically if that cube is a barrier to, um, to one of these uh, tunnels, I will say, yes, there is a cube here. It is a barrier. So this cube does, does need to be, to be displayed. Otherwise, I don't. I just take it out. So what happens here is I take the cube at its location. I go in the world, and I test for the, each interface. I test their location from the interface. Now what this does is for the tunnel, for example, I find the distance from center of the spline. And if I'm within the radius of the spline, then yes, I'm inside envelope, so with an envelope here. And that at that point, I don't want a cube because it's inside the tunnel. When I'm outside of that, then I want a cube. So that's all this, this gives me is, is it empty space or is it solid space? So if we go back to generate grid, so I tested cube. If it's empty, uh, if it's mandatory, I immediately go to add the cube uh, I skip ahead to keep the cube. If it was too far, I skip ahead to just test if it was empty or not. And then when it's empty, I test if it's a barrier cube. The test of barrier is, again, I test cube, but I'm doing it all the surrounding. Um, it's basically uh, all the indices plus one, minus one on every axis. I test around to see if it's empty or solid. If it's solid, then it's not a barrier. If it's empty and I'm solid, then yes, it's a barrier cube, which means it needs to be solid. It needs to stay. So after you test around all the indices around every, every cube, you can then determine if you're keeping the cube or not. So if I'm keeping the cube because it is barrier, I then continue on and then I test. I just, this uh, test for sublevel fill is Let's say the cube is the large cube. I keep large cubes at 25%. So three quarters of them I get rid of. 
after that, I basically, if the cube is kept, um, I come here to this branch and then, well, if I'm generating the cube, I just add the instance and show the cube. Otherwise, I send it down to generate sublevel, which is calling again generate grid. Now, what this does is it will call generate grid at the next smaller level, which will then test the next smaller cube. So if it was the large cube, then it starts testing for all the smaller cubes. Basically, the world is then divided like a, with an oak tree of large cubes, smaller cube, and even smaller cubes, which allows to fill all the little nooks and crannies. So this is why when you have uh, an edge, you tend to get the smaller cubes populating all the little uh, breaks. They will give you like, well, like here you can see that you've got the flat plane, flat plane, and you get this little corner of little cubes. That's because of the subdivision will then retest, am I in the tunnel? Am I not in the tunnel? Am I barrier? And basically, oh yes, this small cube does fit and will fill the, it will fill the spot. So that's how the generation actually happens from the voxel area generator. Now, originally, I was I had a series of lists. Uh, I was just scanning the world, getting all the data, getting all the cube information, doing the removal of the cubes that were not going to be seen because they were behind other solid cubes. I was doing this all in memory, but since I was blueprint only, I was hitting a weird bug where the list would I don't know max out because this is volume the world. Uh, there's a lot of uh, it's a lot of data. And parts of the generation would simply be missing. So like this big tower here, the, the, the main shaft, the top would just be cut off and you wouldn't see it. That's, and I felt that was very weird. I couldn't really, I didn't have time to debug all this. This, uh, again, this was within a jam. So what I ended up doing is either directly generating the cubes, but the generation does take a while for each section. And then I thought, why don't I just output the information directly to a string? So I just dump the code, well, all the cube information, all their locations, location and which if they were level 0, 1, or 3, or 2, directly into just a string. And I, I would copy-paste this string into a CSV. And those CSV, the, basically the sectors, I would then just re-import them as data tables. And this is what the voxel area in the main world is doing. So when we go back to the world designer, oh, sorry, we're already in the world designer. If I go back to the main world, these voxel areas, all they're doing is they're reading from, the, well, from the data tables, which I just put in an enum here to just select. So test level, it's this weird one. Uh, this was end game tunnel. So I can just put the area in the world, say which data table to read from, and it just reads the data and generate all the instances for the cubes. So that's that's how I did it to generate my world. Now the other things I had to do is I needed destructible cubes. Like here, if I do simulate, there's a wall. Now this wall is actually generated from, if I go into world, um, well, it's generated of destructible blocks. The destructible blocks is literally just a cube that when you shoot at it, let me go back to that area. So when you shoot at these, they warm up. And then they cool down. This one is cracked because it's damaged. And then you can break them away. The ones in the main shaft that were right here, which is the other side of that section, they don't actually crack. They just heat up. They require missiles or the charged beam. Uh, so these destructible blocks are individual actors. They're individual blueprints that have a heat value, damage amount, and everything. But to generate them, what I ended up doing is I create a little volume. So if I select this, if I select, where is that actor? Let's 
it's part of this sphere. I just can't select it. Let's see. Uh, active block spawner. Yeah, there we go. So for this for this volume, because it, it's essentially a block that uh, it's well, it's a rectangle that says for the for its area, fill with cubes. You can see it if I move it. You can see it right there. I can shrink it a bit. So now if I simulate again, you notice it's generated less blocks. I do have a flag here, is solid. So if is solid is set, it just fills a flat wall. But I do not want the wall to be solid. I wanted the wall to have a bit of a curve to it to be less well less conspicuous so that the the player would have less of an idea that oh look there's a flat wall I can just shoot it and get through it when the regular walls are not flat so yeah if it's solid it, it looks suspicious it's just this flat wall that just breaks the pattern from all the other walls that are not flat so what I ended up doing for this is I also have a sphere, which is here shell center, and this sphere will actually curve out. The intersection of the sphere and the box is what will actually generate blocks. So if I pull it out a bit, now you just see the tip of the sphere. If I push it back in a bit further, or much deeper, you get well, it's empty inside and you get the edges of the sphere. So basically the intersect of the sphere with the box will create the shape that I was using to fill this wall. Now, the generation of this, so active block spawn spawner here, it does essentially the same as what I did to create the world and then dump into a CSV, but this instead does, does it at runtime. And when it creates the grid or generates the grid, it will actually test by doing a, uh, this is where it spawns, where is the test method? There we go. Test cube method. This time what it's doing instead is doing a box overlap actor. So it's looking to see the box where the cube would go, does it overlap anything else? If it does, don't create a block. So what ends up happening is that volume that I define will only fill space where it can actually put a cube. It will not create cubes that overlap the world that's solid. So that way I minimize the number of actors that are generated. So I'm scanning the same way, large cube, smaller cube, smallest cube. But instead I'm testing if to the world, is it solid? Is it not? Can I put one? This time I want to build a solid area. So there's no need to do the further test to just be, to test if it's a barrier or anything, because I want to just fill the wall. So this is the, this essentially is the live runtime generation of voxels to create my, my breakable blocks. The other ones that are added to the world is these platforms. These platforms are just from the platform spawner and they are creating the blocks, uh, they're, they're being created in construction script. And it's the same thing again, it's the intersection of this box here with this sphere. So if I move this up, you can see the platform shrinks. If I want a bigger platform or if I want to make a sphere, it's the same thing. If I want to make a bigger platform, I can increase the radius. I shouldn't have touched the slider. I should have just typed in. It'll catch up. That's the problem with doing stuff in the construction in the construction um, script. Every time you touch a slider, it builds every time. There we go. So now it uh, made it really big. So let's go back down to 300. So yeah, if I want a semicircle, I just slide it out. Then it's a semicircle platform. So yeah, the intersection of this volume of this box with this sphere is what I fill with cubes using the exact same code for generation and this time it's testing again against the world so if I move this box out it will not it will actually cut to the world it will not overlap the world so this way you get no cubes that are 
overlapping other cubes. You don't get any errors. You don't get penetration between your actual voxels. The other important thing is it's important that when you're actually moving, I had put the uh, position snap to 50 to make sure that uh, my cubes would actually be aligned with the grid because the grid was all aligned f at increments of 50, 100, and 200. And that's how I did my voxel world. So you have the main levels that are generated straight from CSV, the breakable walls that are generated at runtime by scanning the world for intersection, and the platforms that are also generated while well, at construction time, at, at uh, build time, and they are doing the same test as the breakable platforms, or the breakable walls, of testing for, interse for intersections and doing the intersection between the sphere and the box. So that's what I did for the voxel world. Now, after the, after the jam, I decided to refine this a little bit. And now what I've built instead is you've got, let's go to Blueprint. Uh, so let's say I just grab out a voxel blocker sphere. So no need for the interface, no need to test anymore uh, with uh, math or distance from the different, uh, the different carving interfaces. Now, all I did is I created a, it's my own collision channel. So this sphere is actually only blocking in the voxel blocking channel. So now if I pull out a voxel spawner and I make it a tiny bit bigger, let's say three by three by three, and I drag it over the sphere, it's automatically avoiding the volume that I defined for no voxels. So now I can just quickly add either, well, I have generated runtime, which you won't see here. You'll only see if I do simulate or generate at construction time and you can just quickly build all your grids, all your blocks of voxels to fill out your world by placing these volumes. And then these can then be put in the streaming levels and you can chain them, create your entire universe out of these voxelized cubes. Uh, is solid as if you ever needed completely solid generation. Otherwise, it only keeps the visible cube because like what I have here is a tunnel long tunnels so if I turn this one on now you have the tunnel that is following the shape the other about uh, augmentation the other uh, improvement I did uh, when I did the generate world in the original game for the tunnels so actually if I go into the tunnel class and I go when I tested location I actually, I didn't just look at distance from the spline that I was drawing for the tunnels. I did extra flattening so I could get some flat floors. Because uh, I'm sure you've noticed the tunnels, they actually have, the top is rounded and the bottoms are flattened out. Uh, this tunnel is not the best to show this. But yeah, these ones. So it's got a flat floor and a nice rounded top. And that's, I just did some math to flatten out uh, along the negative Z axis, the, the, the distance that I was calculating. Instead now, since I'm no longer using mathematics or anything like that to determine that, what I've changed is the actual tunnel, you can just change the model you use to define it. So if I go to the tunnel itself, and right now voxel blocker cylinder, I just change it to rounded tunnel. Now it's got a flattened base and a round top. So if I go back to the spawner, make it regenerate. Now I've got a nice flat floor with a rounded tunnel. Automatically generates its stairs. Again, if I needed to go back to the tunnel, change it to, I wanted cubes, uh, voxel blocker square regenerate the tunnel. Now it's nice and flat. The ceiling is flat, the walls are 
basically cut out from the cube dragging along the spline. So instead of using math and define some shapes mathematically, instead now I just change the actual mesh that I use for the spline generation to create the uh, the tunnel that I will carve out of these voxel areas. Notice the generation too. This tunnel is about the same volume as the small one I showed originally, and it's it's almost instantaneous. Okay, maybe a second delay. So the next improvement I want to add is to actually spawn the cubes, not all at once, but do it as a gradual. So over a series of frames, generate 100 cube at a time and just have it appear off camera, but slowly. So if you want to generate these at runtime, they don't actually give you a hit, a frame hitch. You can just generate the world and spawn it out as you're in its local area. So you only generate the voxels that are near you and not that are far from you. Uh, otherwise, everything is just generated at build time and you have the areas already ready to spawn when you need them. So this also solves the problem of having these data tables that I was creating to store all the information. You can just prepackage the world with these. Well, again, it's like the Carver interface, but instead it's simply doing an overlap test when generating the cubes. So this is what I did for uh, my Game Jam entry last August. And thank you very much. Have a good night.